James, how are you today? Very well, thank you. How is it going? It's going. It's going all right. I'm in. Uh, I'm in my little office. Tell me where you are. Uh, I'm in kind of my little office. It's like we've got a, a little spare room in the flat, which is the box room that doesn't have any windows to the outside. Uh, which now doubles up as my office slash Crow's merch room. <laughs> I could see boxes of merch in the background. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> But it's boiling hot because there's no window, so I'm literally I'm roasting, sweating. <laughs> oh, it's a good opportunity to shaft the tats, man. There's, uh, That's there's it. a lot of very impressive ink there, mate. Um, <laughs> James, I'm going to kick off today's chat uh, the way I always do, and that's by asking you to tell me, please, the song that you regard as having the greatest ever intro, please. Yeah, that's a good question. I actually want I chose a more, a very recent discovery of mine for this. Like, it was really hard because there's loads of great intros, but I just wanted to, I was thinking a bit more like, what songs I listened to recently have got a really good intro? Because I love a good intro that really like hooks you in. And there's an Irish band called The Scratch. And the song's called Another Round. <clears throat> and uh, um, do you know, have you heard of The Scratch? Have you listened I to have, The Scratch? Yeah. 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 Um, I discovered them because we were at Glastonbury just hanging out. And I went to go see a band called Barming Tiger, who are this crazy Korean hip hop band. And my friend Elliot went to go see The Scratch and I kind of didn't know who it was. I was like, I'm going to go see this, you go see that. And then it was only afterwards that I'd listened to what he'd gone to see and it was one of those moments where I was like, fuck, I really wish I'd gone to see that. Not that I didn't enjoy what I saw, but after I'd listened to it a little bit, I was like, I really wish I'd gone to see that. They're kind of this Irish band who, I think they used to be a metal band. That wasn't really working out for them. So now they play kind of trad Irish music, but in a metal way. Yeah. And uh, the, yeah, another round. It's just a great build up, great intro. Um, yeah, fun band. <laughs> James, tell me a little bit about how you um, approach intros. You're making music in a climate that is very, very fast moving, and uh, attention spans seem to be getting shorter and shorter. And you know, when you go on the streaming platforms, you know, you're constantly being offered new music that's tailored towards your your listening habits um and so i think that can put a lot of pressure on artists to almost grab people right from the off and to to, to try and prick their interest um very much the case i guess for more sort of commercial pop music um but no I guess, yeah definitely it definitely affects, it affects but, all but music doesn't you, you want to get hooked in immediately don't you otherwise i mean it's actually interesting because Sorry, finish your question first. No, okay, you you tell me if, if any of these trends have, have filtered through into your creative process. It's definitely something we've talked about now I think about it, especially... It is. It's like the first, first 30 seconds are quite important because we tend to have a rule that if... When we're writing, just because we've written quite a... Our older stuff especially had quite big intros. We were like one a bit more spacey and we were quite more like psych influenced, I guess, when we first started. Um and then as it got on, we were like, we kind of liked the chorus doesn't come in till like a minute in or whatever. And like we're more like we're more, I guess, aware of that. Yeah. And and I guess it is listening habits, because I'm I'm guilty of definitely like if there's a new song and I'm like, it's not really grabbing me, I will skip it forward a little bit, maybe sometimes. If it's not a band that I love, if it's just something I'm checking out, rather, I am definitely guilty of like skipping forward, which is a really bad habit, and I really hate because I would hate to people do that to my band, which they probably do. Yeah. But <laughs> I don't know if that's just my attention span and whatever. And yeah, I guess it is listening habits. I guess I'm vict- I'm prey of that as well. But um, it's definitely something we take into consideration. But I wouldn't say it's something that uh, would be a decider in if if it was good and we like it but it's a little too long, we'll probably just keep it instead of... But then if it's probably a little bit too longer and we might get a sick opinion from someone, they'll think it's a bit long, then we'll probably cut it down a bit. But yeah, interesting. I've not really thought about it like that before, but that's very interesting. Well, there's no sort of right or wrong answer to to (laughs) that question. I'm always really curious because, uh, you know, I look at, you know, sort of 550 episodes into this podcast now and, and... and, and just looking at, basically, I've grabbed an old paper uh, question sheet that I used to use um, 
pre-lockdown when I used to go to studios before I even knew what Zoom was, where I'd go and meet people <laughs> in, uh, in, in, in studios. And, and the one I've yeah. grabbed here, he's, he's from way before lockdown, which is with um, Blaine from the Mystery Jets. And I've just seen that his answer for this question was Money for Nothing by Dire Straits, which is this huge... That's a very long intro. <laughs> huge, elongated, kind of, you know, over produced 80s you know everything yeah. turns up to 11 and yeah and i just think like would that get a release now you know if you took that to a label now would they be like whoa, whoa what the hell is this like yeah you know, no would if that it's get not on that, radio as a, as a single definitely not absolutely not yeah. <laughs> and there would definitely have to be a heavy radio edit for it to get on the radio yeah. but um which is, is, quite... is that a bad thing you think I don't know if it's a bad thing. I just think it's it's just representative of technology and people's attention span. I think it's yeah. just what it is now, basically. Yeah. It's actually a good point. Whisper off our first EP. That because we did that, we recorded that EP where again we were young and we were like, this is going to be a really good idea. We recorded the whole thing in one take. So that meant all the atmospherics and everything. We kind of had to build in whilst we were doing it mm. so i think it was like the fourth track and so there's this there's this lull in between the third and fourth track so we, we'd recorded it all live and we had to cut it somewhere so i think we cut it right at the end for the track like on digital and vinyl and everything we had to cut the track so i think we cut the track at the end but so whisper has this really long atmospheric introduction which i actually just to keep right now which is probably about 30 seconds. So it's 30 seconds before the riff even comes in. Yeah. Um, but it was still quite one of our highest played songs. So I guess a lot of people were probably skipping that, skipping that 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> James, I'm going to ask you to tell me, please, the first song that you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you, please. Mm. This again, I had to, it was quite difficult. My, my dad's big muso. He's the big. Dylan, Tom Waits, Woody Guthrie fan. So I've grown up with like a lot of influence from my dad for music and, and everything. And I mean, he would have played me all sorts of music growing up, but I, I thought I'd tie in with a song that is still has a really big emotional impact to me. One I remember like from very being very young and even now. And it's Beach Boys, Don't Worry Baby. Because I remember we had like a best of Beach Boys CD in the house, which would have just been like in the house. I didn't think my dad was particularly a huge Beach Boys fan, but it was just in the house. And I, as I grew up in like rural Mid Wales, and I remember just the first time listening to Beach Boys being like, it was just so far away from where I was in this very wet, very beautiful, but very wet Mid Wales. And like being like 11, 12, 13, like going skating all the time, like wanting just to see more of the world and to hear the Beach Boys singing about all this california sun and surfing was just like a completely alien world to me but then i remember hearing don't worry baby like it's, for me it's one of the most beautiful songs i've written i'm a really big, huge fan of the song i think we saw brian uh them play it at primavera barcelona 2017 brian wilson sorry not the beast Boys. and i'd probably been up for a long time the night before I was probably pretty hungover and probably feeling a little the effects of somebody else but I remember starting to cry and I remember like my girlfriend at the time turned around to look at me my friends were looking at me and I was just like tears rolling down from, from behind my sunglasses and I was like I didn't think I'd ever really like cry at a song live but hearing that song brought back loads of like memories from my childhood and like my family and my dad and yeah I was just think it's a beautiful song the harmonies are amazing the lyrics are great yeah, it's just one of those really important songs to me. It's a, it's an absolutely magical record, and I saw Brian on that 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 tour as well. I, I, he yeah. come, he came to the UK uh, in 2017, and he was playing Pet Sounds in its entirety, and then he was yeah sort of, he, he played it, all the other hits afterwards as well. And to to see like the rest of the band leave, and he just sat at a piano and started playing God Only Knows. Hell yeah! There yeah. was. <laughs> There was a lot of men in their fifties and sixties, all sort of uh, biting their bottom lip while it was. <laughs> it was uh, it was absolutely <laughs> beautiful. It, it, it really was. Um, can you? Uh, because 
I had the same experience as you with, with, with Beach Boys. It was like, you know, there's not a lot of Californian sun in Essex. And um, when you first hear the Beach Boys, for me, it was like things like watching Team Wolf and hearing surf in USA and stuff like that. <laughs> and and it just being this American dream and, and, and everything just being this sort of sun-kissed rock and roll. Can you remember hearing sort of pet sounds for the first time and going, hang on, this ain't like the other stuff. This is, wow, this is <laughs> deep. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing, I watched the um, the biopic of the day with, what's his name? From High Fidelity. Yes. Yeah, I always uh, forget his name. Uh, <sighs> he's got a sister who's an actor as well. Uh, oh, God, what's his yeah, name? Bam, bam. Him. Ah, oh, that's kind of really annoying. Anyway, have you, yeah, you watched it. I, I thought it was cool. I really liked it, but I'm glad it focused so much on the creation of those records. John Cusack. Like, John Cusack, there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's it's just fantastic album. And all the later stuff I, I really like, even though it's so bizarre and a real snapshot into his mind at the time. But um, like Vegetables, all those songs, they're all fucking... Crazy, but I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, if I remember rightly, uh, on vegetables, some of that uh, celery percussion is Paul McCartney. (laughs) Oh, really? That's Paul McCartney biting celery on the the percussion of uh, vegetables. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. Um, (laughs) You mentioned that uh, your dad was a muso. So was the stereo always on at home? Radio is always on. CDs always on. Definitely CDs in the car. That was the big one. We'd always yeah. listen to CDs in the car. He's a big like country Americana fan. So like lots of Mary Black, uh, Gillian Welch, uh, who else? All those. Eliza Gilkerson. Those are yeah, really yeah. like beautiful, amazing singer songwriters. That's like what I was brought up on. Oh, my dad. Yeah. I'm going to ask you for track three now to tell me the song that reminds you of the time <laughs> at school, please, mate. <laughs> uh, I chose Slipknot, Wait and Bleed, because mm-hmm. I was in high school. Uh, when was I? When did I leave high school? I started the university in 2008. So I was in high school, mid 2000s, early to mid 2000s. Like I was, and new metal was huge, and I was really into new metal. <laughs> And so much so that I, I, well, I remember it would be, it was my tape recorder and I had a Walkman. I would record stuff by holding the tape player up to the TV on like MTV2, Kerrang, whatever. And I would record straight from the TV and then listen to that on the school bus on the way home. And I don't know how I, how I still have hearing really, but the, the quality was not great. Let's put it that way. But, um, I was just, I loved it. I was, my first gig was Machine Head. That was like, um, the, we had we had a really good youth service where I was from as well. So he, we had a youth worker called Paul Rowe who would like pile us all into a minibus, uh, drive us to Newport, Cardiff, Birmingham, Manchester, whichever one was closest to whatever gig we wanted to go to. He would go, like we'd all pile into the gig, have like fun as like 13, 14 year olds, come back, he'd drive us all the way back home, like two and a half hours, three hours. And uh, it was it was amazing. It was like really formative. It made me just know that I wanted to be a musician. And uh, yeah, it was a tribute to just having a really, really great youth service, which I think is the biggest travesty how much the youth service has failed now and doesn't exist anymore. Because um, I so I, was, what I, know, I, I owe so much to him and and those experiences as a kid. Otherwise, I probably would have gone probably not a very good way a lot of especially where i'm from is i love where i'm from but it's very rural it's not a huge amount to do there's not a lot of work as soon as you turn 16 anyway so a lot of people do fall into drugs or fall into like yeah i'm just yeah i'm very thankful i had a very good use services and i think it's something that should definitely be funded way more than. yeah absolutely and and i think new metal I think if you're in your formative years, and and the reason being is, I uh, way back in the the sort of late nineties, we was I was in a band and we was getting a, a bit of attention from from labels, and uh, and we looked quite 
average. We just looked like a, a rock band. Like we, we we didn't look particularly overly exciting. And I remember sitting in a label, and I think it was Sony BMG. No, it was Epic. It was Epic. And we yeah. sat there, and they said, "Look, we like what you're doing, but we kind of we want our next sign to look like this." <laughs> and they held up like Kerrang, and Marilyn Manson was on the cover. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I remember being like pretty put out because I thought we looked pretty fucking cool, but <laughs> we didn't look like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and as he done it, I thought prick, but. <laughs> If you're 13, 14, you're going to want to watch and listen to this dude because <laughs> he looks fucking incredible. Do you know what I mean? And, like, yeah, that's yeah. the dude that your parents are going to go, what are you listening to that shit for? And, like, and that's – he looks way more punk rock than what we were. And, like, and I guess that's what you want as a teenager, isn't you? I mean, just, I, I remember seeing the Wait and Bleed video, sitting on video, and just being like, there are these eight crazy dudes all wearing masks, mate. jumping around, jumping around on stage. I'm like, I want more of this. This is fucking cool. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. You, you, you know, it, at that time, you're going to get off of that or the stereophonics you know, or Travis. <laughs> and look, I'm not dissing them in bands, but if you're a, 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 you know, an excitable young kid, Slipknot's exactly what you want, isn't it? It looks, yeah, yeah, it looks sort of amazing, and yeah, and <laughs> yeah, in, interesting, and you want to know more about it. But uh, well, look, you, you mentioned that um, the radio was on at home, and there was music in the cars and that. Um, was there instruments laying around at home? Was was that something that was encouraged growing up? Yeah, man. My so my dad played the guitar. He was in like the folk group. His college, his tech tech college. Um, so he, I think, yeah, the first instrument I learned was the baron, like the Irish round Irish drum, because yeah. he had one of those. He was like, "Can learn that?" I think we even had a baron school at club, uh, baron club at school, because there was a few kids who had one. I wanted to teach the play. He was like, "Why don't we start a club?" I'm like, "I was fucking really young." Yeah. Um, banjo. He yeah, played a little bit banjo. Yeah. Yeah, there was always little instruments around. And I remember when I was like, I want to learn how to play guitar. He was like, yes, <laughs> we can We can make that happen. <laughs> Did, you know, you, you mentioned that obviously for anything geek-wise and that you had to travel. Um, and did it did it feel like, was music something that you knew you wanted to do at school? Like, like you know, was that something you thought could be a potential career or did, did it feel being... From where you was from, it you know the path to, to 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 get in there might be more tricky than say people that lived in the aforementioned Manchester or even London. Mm, I think probably to begin with, I was just more just like I just want to play music as much as I can. I don't think I think I would. I was talking about something else because remember when you have to do like career days or whatever they're called, and you have to write down like potential career paths, and you have a career counselor, blah blah blah. I think I remember writing chef. Um. Or, and professional skateboarder, which was definitely never going to happen. But well, it's, I'll, I'll put stuntman. <laughs> so you got a dream big. <laughs> <enough>. Yes, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, but then, uh, as definitely as I got older, I was like, "This is all I want to do." And then I was like, "How? How can I make that happen?" And yeah, I, I guess I we'd been on a few like art trips to London as well, um, which are cool. I had again had really good had really good art teachers, really good music teachers who were very very supportive and very encouraging. So we'd been in a few art trips to London with the with my art course or with the art class and I knew I wanted to move to London. Then I was like, well, I want to play music in London. And then that was kind of it. As soon as I was 18, uh, moved to London. I started a band. So <laughs> tell me the first song you remember buying from a record shop, please. Again, not very cool. This one's not meant to be cool, mate. <laughs> <laughs> First CD I remember buying with my own money was Will Smith, Big Willie style. Mm -hmm. uh, again, because I was probably about nine or ten, and he was arguably one of the biggest pop stars in the world. Absolutely. Um, vinyl probably came a bit later. A little bit cooler. 
I still listen to it to be honest. I still love the record. Uh, Bright Eyes, Lifted, All the Stories in the Soil, Keep Your Ear to the Ground. I'm still a big Bright Eyes fan. I don't know if it's very cool still anymore or if it was ever cool. But uh, Bright Eyes was one of those artists I loved in my kind of early 20s. Uh, maybe I should know. Maybe, yeah, definitely. Maybe from like 18. When I was like really starting to like drink and smoke, and I was like, man, he drinks and smokes. He's really like angsty and whiny. He fucking gets it. I was really into it. Um, and uh, But I never really bought, I never, never bought vinyl because I was like always had my laptop or my fucking MP3 player. And I remember seeing it. I was like, you know what? I really love this album. I'm going to buy it on vinyl. And then encouraged myself to go out and buy a vinyl player. So. That was the first vinyl I bought. But yeah, Big Willie style. I can't remember what the first tape I bought. I was trying to think and rack my brains what the first tape would have been, but that probably was something like Limp Biscuit. But then me and my sister shared everything. So like yeah. she would buy something and then I'd steal it and we'd argue about who had it for the longest. Um but yeah, I can't remember the tape. But yeah, definitely Will Smith. Can you I probably still have it to be honest somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> Can you um pick back up on where you left off, you said uh, you, you moved to London and started a band. And, you know, millions of people moved to London and start a band. Um, <laughs> yeah. Can you give us a sort of, you know, an insight into the early days of form, you know, forming that? And, and I'm presuming playing the toilet circuit around Camden. Oh, and yeah. Various. Uh, Water, Water Rats and King's Cross. Yeah. The first, well, okay, I'll give you the first backstory was, so I, Moved to university, Westminster, uh, whereas we're, where I met Steve and Jit. But we didn't start Crows until a bit later on. But me and Steve, guitar player in Crows, uh, our first band was called Dudezilla. And we were a two man punk, heavy punk band. <laughs> I played guitar and sang. Steve played drums. Mm-hmm. Uh, so again, very. Influence of those two man groups, two person yeah. groups at the time. Um, and it was pretty funny because we would just get really stoned and write silly, stupid lyrics and write these really like heavy, fast punk songs and sing those these stupid fucking stoned lyrics over the top of them. And um, yeah, we did that for a little bit. Actually, we did that for probably about a year, two years. Just again, doing the, the pay to play gigs in Camden and King's Cross. And then. I mean, how, how do you find you, you stay on, on, on top of kind of being driven in, in, in you know, them them shows? Because, you know, I, I played a lot of those as well. And, yeah. and you know, pay to play is, you know, uh, is a pretty gross thing. And, uh, and also, you know, if you turn up and, you brought five people along to a show and then you turn up to play the Dublin Castle and the other two bands haven't brought anyone. Mm. It's a long night, isn't it? And, it's, br- it's fucking brutal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you see these documentaries of Coldplay playing their first ever show at the Dublin Castle and, you know, it's heaving and it's like, yeah. I don't remember the realities of that. And, and, <laughs> and I think, you know, you'd get all your mates to one show and then they're not going to want to come and see you the next week. They're going to want to wait a few months till they can, you know, afford to come and see you again. So I always found that sometimes you sort of feel a little dejected if like you, you know, for us coming from Essex, we drive into London or we drive up to Sheffield, Manchester, whatever, and, and play to six or seven people. And, yeah, you know, it's hard to keep your chin up sometimes. Do you know what I mean? It really is. Yeah, you've got to have a lot of friends, a lot of good friends who will come and support you no matter what. Luckily, we, luckily, I mean, we still had those ones, but a lot of the time we'd always like make a night out of it. And like, yeah. luckily, we had a lot of good friends who would come and support us. But yeah, again, I remember a, a Doozilla gig at the Barfly, which is now Camden Assembly. Uh, and it was our one friend, Rochelle, in the middle of the room. And we would just be like, I was like, do we even bother playing? <laughs> and it's, the promoter was like, yeah, you've got to play. More people come upstairs. I was like, I don't think they are, mate. It's like everyone's downstairs drinking. I don't want to come yeah. here and listen to Dudezilla. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was, yeah, I've always, I always find that one pretty funny. The one friend, Rochelle, stood in the middle of the room and she was like, play for me, boys. I was like, okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Shout out, Rochelle. Um, <laughs> well, look, you said you'd make a night of it. So that leads on uh, lovely. 
uh, to our next question, and that's the song that soundtrack your years clubbing. Yeah, again, clubbing. I don't. I guess we would club. I'd club in like first couple of years of university. I reckon we'd go to clubs, but I think we we always much preferred hanging out at venues. And I guess that is kind of clubbing, isn't it? You go to club yeah. nights and dance. It can be dirty indie nights. It's not got to be neon. True. You know, yeah, I venues. think I read. It. I think I read it wrong. But yeah. I think the the question, the answer still. I think I chose Crystal Castle's Crime Wave. Yeah. Because it's like kind of electronic, and that's I think what I was going in my head like a more electronic. You go in and go dance to. But I remember we fucking loved Crystal Castle's. Um, and yeah, probably when we were doing lots of chemicals as well in my younger days. <laughs> Uh no, great record. I love that record a lot. Crime Wave, um, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that song. I can't remember what that record's called. Actually, what's uh, that record called? Um, but again, it was one of those ones where we downloaded it. We just had like all the files on, yeah. it and we would play it at the afters yeah. and after fucking playing, getting the DJ to play it in the in the club over and over again. <laughs> where would you go? Would you be going out in Camden or East? Yeah, earlier on. Kilburn, we lived in Kilburn, so Camden we go out in quite a lot, and Kilburn. Then we kind of started going more east, um, and then the, I think the big formative years were Shackwell Arms, Moth Club, which we still kind of to go to. Yeah, I'd say. But um, earlier on, the, the Holy, I used to work at the Holy Arms for a long time in Camden. Yeah, that created a lot of fun nights. Um, the Lock Tavern, we would go to. Have fun in there a lot. Where else? Joe's? Oh, it all blurs together now. I think a lot of places are close yeah. as well. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunately they have. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you you worked at a lot of them venues at the right time by the sounds of things as well. You know, that that, yeah. that kind of time for, for music was, and, and guitar music was really exciting to be kind mm. of in that hybrid of North and then a lot of it obviously moved East as well. And, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I think, those days of rock and roll pubs and clubs in East London seem to be a thing of the past now. And, yeah. Uh, Camden's yeah. still holding strong. Do you know Yeah, I mean? you can still go to Camden and there'll be someone with a very low cut shirt with some tattoo stick name. And <laughs> you'll still get, still get a warm beer. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> um, for track six, I'm going to uh, take you home and I'm going to ask you to tell me a favourite song from an artist from your home county, please. Uh, Catlebon, home to you. And now I've just realized it said county, not country. Don't worry, I've done 550 th- episodes, it'll <laughs> be the 530 if one that said that. So don't worry, mate. you're not on your own. <laughs> she might well be from Paris. I don't know. Paris is a huge county. Mm. I'm not entirely sure if she's from Paris, though. Yeah. So I don't want to, I don't want to. Doing my um, homework on you and then looking at what you sent over, I thought there's no way Catlebon's from Mid Wales. <laughs> well, I know she's Welsh, but I don't know if she's from Mid Wales. But um, yeah, it's again, great fucking great singer, great songwriter, um, beautiful song, mm. absolutely wonderful song. Um, and it's like, I mean, there is good Welsh music at the moment, but if you compare to like, we were thinking, we were, we were talking about this at, uh, when we were at Glastonbury. I didn't want to keep talking about Glastonbury like I was there. That's the, my whole being. This just happened to pop on my head. <laughs> how many great Irish bands there were at Glastonbury and how much great Irish music that was coming out at the moment. And it's like, there is really good Irish, uh, good Welsh music coming out at the moment, but not on the level or the, I think, the amount of coming out of Ireland at the moment. Yeah. And I don't know why. I just can't, I can't tell you why, but... I think Welsh music bombarded, you know, the, the, us in, in, in the mid to late 90s. There was... True. You know, <laughs> absolutely... <laughs> Fantastic. I'm actually seeing the Manics on, on Saturday, funnily enough. Um, nice. But um, they're, yeah, they're supporting the Pet Shop Boys. So uh, yeah. I'm Hell yeah. To, uh, watch the Manics at the weekend. But there's a Scottish, uh, sorry, a Welsh band. And uh, um, we played with them at, I'm probably going to offend Wales now, Club Eva Back. Eva Back, yeah. That? Yeah. Back, I mean, yeah, close. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So we, we, we played with this band um, called Terrace. And okay. uh, and they, I think they were one of the first bands to get on the cover of the NME before they had a record deal. And they were the most incendiary <laughs> band I've ever seen. They were fucking incredible, James. They 
<laughs> they they didn't have a bass player. They had a guy on like a little three hundred three, just make, and it was the, the the front man was like Ian Curtis. It was a fucking mad sound, and they got so much hype, and then it just went boom, and nothing happened. And it was such Damn. a shame. They were so good. They were managed by the guy that was in another great Welsh band called Sixty Foot Dolls. Um, this is all a bit before your time. I'm aware of this, okay. but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, and they were all part of that kind of Cardiff scene that was exploding around that time with, I guess, Catatonia were coming through the rankings then and Super Furries and, yeah. and yeah, and obviously the, the bigger hitters like the Seraphonics and Manics, et cetera. Um, but yeah, there's, some, there's still some great Welsh music coming out at the moment. Um, who's the girl that was in the Pipettes? What's her name? Mm, that's... She was up for the Mercury last year, I think. Um Oh God, what is her name? Uh, Gweno. Oh, uh, sorry, yes. Yeah. That is an amazing record with the shirt. That that record with the grey cover. Yeah. Is a beautiful record, actually. Yeah. I'm not yeah. gonna lie. That's really good. That is a, that is an absolute beauty. Um it's your opportunity to tell us about a, a, another beauty now, because this is uh, the moment where I'm gonna ask you uh to tell the listeners this podcast about a song that you think they may not know that you would like them to hear. Yeah, this, okay. So it's it's a Blaze Foley song called Pitch Cards Can't Picture You. Are you familiar with Blaze Foley? I wasn't until today. And uh, so, and I went through it and I, I listened to it and it's it's quite beautiful. Okay, again, I can't remember how I found Blaze Foley anyway, but there's one record on Spotify. It's, it's the covers I could paint, uh, draw a painting of him. And I think I just, it's one of those albums that I just found on Spotify and started listening to. And I was like, wow, this is right up my street. This is what I love. This song isn't on that album. This is a separate album. But that's what hooked me into Blaze Foley and first. And then I, get, then I got reading about him, like read about his story. Kind of one of those eyes who never really made it very big, then had quite a tragic death. Uh, I think he got shot defending someone's dad in an argument. There's a really good biopic about him as well, which I only just watched recently. Um, and Pitch Cards Can't Picture You is from, he did a live album just before he died. In It's just like a live album from a pub, from like a bar in Austin. And it's like 20, 21 tracks. And it's just him, like, you can just hear him progressively get more and more drunk throughout the night. Like people getting up and playing harmonica with him. And... There is another recording of this song. This is because I think he wrote it just before this gig and then died subsequently very shortly afterwards. And uh, it's just one of the most beautiful songs that I've ever, ever listened to. Lyrics are amazing. Harmony's brilliant. He's just so, he's got such a huge, soulful voice. And it just sounds like he's in so much pain, but it's so beautiful, so wonderful. And uh, yeah, I couldn't, I can't recommend anyone to listen to Blaze Foley more. I just love him so much. He's one of those one of those artists I can put on, especially that record. I can't remember that record's called. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's called Clay Pigeons, the record, but it's it's one of those records I can stick on at any time of the day during any situation. I'm still going to listen to it all the way through because I fucking love it. And I can listen to it start to finish as well. It's a beautiful, beautiful record. Uh but that that live one is really nice as well. There's some great stuff on that, especially this song. But um, yeah, just great songwriter. Well, we make it nice and easy for people to go and listen to it, James, because Thanks. we've put together a little Spotify playlist to accompany the podcast. With not just my mum rambling mumbles. <laughs> like, uh, well, people can go and listen to uh, all of the tracks that you've chosen, and obviously. Um, we will be adding your music to it as well, which we should discuss nice. because we've been talking about everybody else's music. So what's happening with you? Tell me what's happening. Yeah, man. New records coming out 27th of September. Um, new singles coming out in a couple of days on the 5th. First two have gone pretty well. I think people are really liking it. We've had loads of six music plays, which is I think the most we've had from from singles, which is nice. That's always a good sign. Um, yeah, it's just nice to have it finally coming out. We've we've been writing it for. I mean, it, we just, the longest we've taken to write a record, I reckon. But um, so I guess probably from from beginning to 
finishing recording it was probably about two years um and yeah just really happy with it it sounds great i think it's the best work we've ever done which i know everyone says about their new records but i think i truly believe that <laughs> what about shows shows we're wrapped up for the summer now we just had a really nice we had a kind of chill summer because we weren't really on album cycle um but we still did some really cool fucking weird gigs in we played in switzerland we played in like a it was inside a swiss oh yeah inside it was like on a a ski resort uh, in the summertime obviously so we were playing on the grass in this beautiful setting just like in the middle of the swiss alps and there was just like cheese and wine everywhere uh, we played the great gig in Budapest. So we know, like a big festival. We've only played that once before, but it's nice to get back there. Italy, we played for the first time. So we've done like these really nice little independent festivals, uh, just kind of ticking along. And then tour starts in October. Fantastic. UK, UK October, Europe, November, really. And James, if people want to find out about where that tour is going to be going, further release dates and such, where's the best place to keep up to speed with everything that's happening? throwsband.co.uk wonderful we'll put that link in the show notes to the uh this episode so people can uh make sure they're only one click away from you and uh are you happy for us to to tag you in all the posts on social so people aren't following news on the, the social media uh, and they can do so i implore it yes thank you wonderful james yeah. it's been an absolute delight talking records with you mate my, it's been my pleasure thank you very much absolutely absolutely i'm going to press stop don't go anywhere.